Okay, uh, part two, Le Chatelier's Principle, not Le Chatelier, Le Chatelier. Um, really not a hard concept, one of those things that if you haven't seen it and you get questions about it, then yeah, it's difficult. It's really just relative knowledge and it, it kind of makes sense. Um, in your notes, you know, here's what the book says. Uh, they give you what Le Chatelier actually said. Equilibria is affected by temperature, pressure, and concentration of reactants and products. In other words, it's affected by the environment in which you run the reaction. We already know that. KEQ, that number is established environmentally. The number changes in a different environment. If a system is at equilibria a, and is stressed, all right, so stress means you're going to come in and you're going to change one of those factors. You're going to change the temperature or you're going to reduce the pressure or you're going to add in some more product or reactants into the reaction mixture. Then the system is going to shift towards restoring the equilibrium. In other words, the position of the equilibria will change, but unless you change the temperature, the KEQ number will remain constant. That's what they mean by relieving the stress. So you can change the position of the equilibria, um, but only a temperature change will actually change the value of the equilibria constant. Okay, so what does that mean? What does that mean? Uh, what does that mean? What it means is we can change the environment and we can kind of trick the system into giving us a better yield. For instance, suppose we had this reaction. A plus B uh, produces C. Okay, and then we're going to run that reaction, and what we can do is after it reaches equilibria, we got our little beaker in here, right, and we always draw water with waves. In a water environment, we're going to have some A left over in there, limiting reagent, and, and according to equilibria, we might have a little bit of B left over, and then we're going to produce some product C. Now, if we were to boil out chemical C, in other words, distill it, then the only thing that we're going to have left in the beaker at that point is our particles of A and B. When that happens, let's say our KEQ was uh, chemical C over A times B equals some number. Let's 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 make it I don't know twelve again, right? Like we did in the last video. Well. Now that you've boiled out chemical C, you've removed product. So now we're no longer in equilibria here. We have a value of zero for chemical C. We have three particles of A. We have one particle of B. And then this ends up being zero divided by three. Zero. So our Q is less than K. So that means the reaction is now going to proceed in the forward direction until it reaches equilibria. In other words, we created a certain amount of product in our first vessel. We got rid of that product, and so now the system is going to say, all right, we got a little bit of uh, reactants left over, and now this thing is no longer at equilibria. So those reactants, some of them are going to react and produce some product. And then this way we can boil out that product that we make. So we can actually increase the yield of this reaction through what's called the Chatelier's effect. We're going to stress the system. We're going to remove the product, and then the system is going to reestablish equilibria. It's going to reestablish that value of 12 based upon what we left inside the chamber. All right, so what do you have to do then on the test? Uh, well, they're going to give you a balanced equation, and they're going to say, all right, if we increase the amount of reactants, or we decrease them, or we increase the products, and we decrease the products, is that going to favor the forward reaction, or is that going to favor the reverse reaction? In other words, is the position of the equilibria going to shift to the right, where some of our reactants are going to become products? Or is it going to shift to the left where some of our products are going to become reactants again in that effort to maintain that KEQ value? And then they're going to say, all right, well, how does pressure affect it? That's pretty easy. Pressure only affects gases, so we'll look to see where the gases are. If they're on the reactant side, it affects the reactant side. If it's on the product, it affects the products. And then lastly, we'll take a look at how temperature changes KEQ. So I'm going to try to do this with a little bit of a chart. Alright, 
So the stress. Now this is a, a two-step process. You make a change, the system reacts, and that's it. It's not a back and forth type of thing, but the stress is controlled by you. You're gonna change something in the reaction. And we're gonna have some sort of result of that. And then some of the things they may ask you is, uh, does this favor the reverse reaction or the forward reaction? So favors forward or reverse. Uh, reaction um, is that a shift so we want to know is that a shift to the right or is that a shift to the left and then finally um, is there a change in the value of KEQ and we said only temperature changes the value of KEQ so we can go through this pretty quickly if you increase the concentration of your reactants the system says, whoa, wait a minute. Now you got too many reactants. We're going to take some of the reactants and produce products until we get back to the KEQ value. So, and this, the result would be that we are stimulating the forward reaction. So some of the reactants we add. They're going to react and become products. And we would say that an increase in reactant, we dump in more reactant into our beaker, then that is going to favor the forward reaction. And we would say that the position of the equilibria shifts to the right. You can write the word right if, or a right arrow, either way is fine. And we would have no change in the value of KEQ because again, the only thing that changes the value of KEQ is a change in temperature. All right, so what happens then if we were to remove reactants. Okay, so we're gonna lower the concentration of reactants. I don't know, maybe we boil some of the reactants out through distillation, or uh, maybe we recrystallize things and then filter them out. Well, now there's not enough reactant. We remove some reactant, the system says, whoa, wait a minute, you removed reactant, there's not enough reactant here. So some of our products decompose and become reactants. Let's just write the word two, T-O, two reactants. And this would favor the reverse reaction. And that is a shift to the left. And again, there's no change in the actual value of KEQ. Now, do understand, not all of the products become reactants and not enough of the products uh, decompose to replace all of your reactants but it does replace some of it and again the position the numbers that make up the equilibria uh the keq value do change and it shifts in a way that we're looking at the reverse reaction per products become reactants so here's what i'd like for you to do i'd like for you to pause the video and try these two things if we increase the amount of products what's going to happen and if we were to decrease the concentration of the products what happened? So I'll pause, give you a chance to fill that in, and then come right back. Hey, I'm right back. All right, so we increase the products. The reaction says, whoa, wait a minute, too many products. So some of the products we add, some products become reactants. And again, this is the reverse direction. So we're going to say that this favors the reverse reaction. It is a shift to the left with no change in the value of KEQ. And if we remove products, the system says, whoa, wait a minute, not enough product. We're gonna replace some of those products. So some reactants become products. And that favors the forward direction. So our equilibria shifts to the right with no change in the actual value of KEQ. All right, another way it might look on a test. So we have a reaction. A plus B produces AB. And then, all right, our stress is that um, we are going to increase the concentration of A. All right, so what happens to the concentration of A 
what happens to the concentration of B? What happens to the concentration of AB? All right, and this is where students kind of screw this up a little bit, so I'm going to explain it. Remember, not all of the chemical A that you add is going to be shifted. So we say, all right, well, A. A is a reactant, so we are now stimulating the reactant side. Too many reactants. So some of those reactants are going to become products, and that's a shift to the right. Okay. So we know that in order for reactants to become products, our concentration of chemical B goes down, and our concentration of chemical A goes up. But what a lot of students mess up, even at the AP level, is what happens to the concentration of A? It goes up. Why did it go up? Because you made it go up. You're the one who added chemical A. So remember, not all of the chemical A you add is going to get consumed due to the Le Chatelier shift, only some of it. So ultimately, whatever concentration of A you had, it's going to be a little bit higher when you end because of the fact that you added more chemical A. So that would be something that you should watch out for on multiple choice. Now, the last two things, pressure. Pressure is analogous, so I'm going to do a little squiggly equals instead of a real equals. It's analogous to increasing or decreasing the concentration of something. However, it has to be a gas. So it only affects gases. So what you have to do is you have to take a look at your reaction. If you have something like this, let's say we're going to take uh, hydrochloric acid and we're going to put a piece of zinc in there, and I'm writing the molecular version of this. And although it's a single arrow reaction, we're going to put double arrow anyway. And we get uh, hydrogen gas and we get zinc chloride. So I'll go back here and balance it where the hydrogen gas is a product. All right, so what happens if we decrease the pressure? All right, so decreasing the pressure of the system is only going to affect the gas. So it affects the hydrogen, which is on the product side. So in this particular reaction, since the moles of gas are on the product side, we're going to focus on the product side. So a decrease in pressure winds up being the same in terms of the effect as decreasing the concentration of the hydrogen. It's not exactly the same because we haven't decreased the amount of hydrogen. What we've done is we've decreased the space between the particles. Um, that has slowed down the reaction, then the position of the equilibria has shifted, but it's going to behave the same way. And as a result, the reaction says, well, wait a minute, you don't have enough product collisions going on right now. You don't have enough collisions that are going to produce the reverse reaction. So this is going to be analogous to uh, removing or de um, decreasing the concentration of hydrogen. And so the system says, wait a minute, not enough product particle collisions going on right now. So the effect is going to be that some of our reactants are going to produce products in order to compensate. And that means that we are dealing with favoring the forward reaction. And therefore that is an equilibrium shift to the right. So we're gonna write shifts to the right. And of course there is zero change in KEQ because only temperature changes the value of KEQ. All right, so suppose we had this reaction. What if we have moles of gas on the reactant side? Well, then we're going to treat it like we're affecting the reactant side. Fine. Same as with the product. However, what if you have to get moles of gases on both sides, like this reaction? We have three moles of hydrogen gas plus one mole of nitrogen. Again, a gas and that produces two moles of ammonia. Well, if we increase the pressure, how is this system gonna respond? Well, it increases the number of particle collisions on the reactant side, so it increases the collisions on the forward reaction. However, there's gases on the product side too, and it increases 
the product side collision, which means it increases the number of collisions per second for the reverse reaction. However, there are more particles of reactants. If you add this up, you have four moles of gas on your reactant side, and you only have two moles of gas on your product side. So it affects both sides, but it affects the reactant side more. So when you have moles of gas on each side, then you focus on the side that has more gas, more moles of gas. So we're going to focus on the reactant side. So increasing the pressure here is going to be analogous to uh, increasing reactant concentration. It's going to behave the same way. So that means that we are going to have too many reactant collisions. Some reactants become products. That is a equilibrium shift to the right, so it favors the forward direction. And if we were to take a look at the concentration changes, what happens to the concentration of hydrogen as a result? It goes down. What happens to the concentration of nitrogen? It goes down. And what happens to the concentration of the ammonia? It goes up. What happens to KEQ? Zero change. No change in the value of KEQ. All right, the last one. What happens if we change the temperature of a reaction? Glad you asked. All right, so suppose we have this reaction. A plus B produces AB, and we find that the delta H for this reaction is equal to, I don't know, I'm gonna make up a number here, negative uh, 15 kilojoules per mole reaction. Okay, great. So we said that an increase in temperature favors the endothermic process. Okay, so that means the opposite is true. A decrease in temperature favors the exothermic process. All right, great. So what happens here? Let's say we're gonna increase the temperature. How is this thing gonna respond? Well, there's two ways of looking at this. First, you gotta take a look at delta H. If it's a negative value, that means the reaction is exothermic. All right, well, wait a minute. We have a reversible reaction here, so are they talking about the forward reaction or the reverse? Whenever they write a thermodynamic equation like this with the delta H, the enthalpy value, uh, they're always referring to the forward reaction, so that means that this is going to be a forward exothermic reaction. If it was a positive value, then that means that the reverse, uh, uh, the forward reaction would be endothermic. So first thing I would do is say, all right, well, if this is exothermic, does it absorb heat or does it release heat? Well, exothermic releases heat. So we can think of heat as being a product of this reaction. And it's gonna behave the same way as if we were to increase the product side. Since heat is on the product side, we're gonna focus on the product side. And the result of this Le Chatelier shift is gonna be analogous to if we were to increase the concentration of the products. Now, we didn't increase the concentration of the products. We change the temperature. We change the environment. Okay. So what does that mean? Well, just like if we're increasing the concentration of the product system, saying, wait a minute, with the extra heat that you added from the environment, there's too much going on now on the product side. So we're going to take some of those products, and they are going to become reactants, which means we are favoring the forward reaction. That is an equilibrium shift. Oh, I'm sorry, wait a minute. Increase the products. That means some products become uh, reactants. That's not a forward reaction. I'm sorry, products becoming reactants is the reverse reaction. So this favors the reverse reaction, and that's an equilibrium shift to the left. Now, KEQ does change. Now, they're not asking you to determine what the change is. The change is uh, based upon an equation called the Arrhenius equation, and we're not getting into it at this level. Um, but if you wanted to make an assessment here, you could say, well, this favors the products. So when we do KEQ, we have products over reactants, which means this value is getting larger, 
this value is getting smaller, so overall this value is going up quite a bit. So in this case, KEQ would go up. All right, so what if you had this reaction? Let's do A plus B produces AB, and the delta H for this is equal to positive 32 kilojoules per mole reaction. And I want to know what would happen as a result of increase, or I'm sorry, let's go with decreasing the temperature this time. Let's decrease the temperature. I'm going to pause it. You're going to work on it and then come back and check your answer. Hey, I waited patiently. I'm back. All right, so a decrease in temperature. Great. Well, let's take a look at what delta H says. Delta H says that this is a positive value. So that means that the forward reaction is endothermic. So that means that the heat is on the reactant side. And we're decreasing the heat, which means that it's analogous to decreasing reactant concentration. It's gonna behave the same way. So we don't have enough going on now on the reactant side. So that means some products are gonna to have to become reactants in order to compensate. That is a shift to the left and favors the reverse reaction. And KEQ changes because temperature change is the only thing that changes KEQ. Again, if we wanted to go into how it changes, again, the product number is going up, the reactant numbers are going down, and that's going to give me an increase in KEQ. All right. Thank you very much.